back. Uh, so we're about to start the first session, and in this session we're going to focus on some applications of the programming factory, which are kind of what I think of as the kind of historical part of the commercial and application of the programming. Things like formal methods, testing, simulation. We're going to see a few different talks in these areas there. And speaking of the heart of functional programming, uh, John Lockford is going to be the first talk. He uh, founded the law and was the uh, first uh, steering committee of CUOP, the first uh, chair of the steering committee of CUOP. Uh, and the law has been a long kind of stalwart in, in, in the kind of push to take functional programming and really move for for real applications. And so uh, welcome John is here with us today about uh, using formal methods to drive an AES implementation. So um, uh, yeah, what I want to talk about is, um, uh, I hesitate to say formal methods, even though the word um, theorem is <laughs> But um, this idea of step-by-step -step refinement has long been something that the academic world has looked at and say, we want to be able to produce things by step-by-step -step refinement. And you can find lots of compelling uh, cases in the um, exercise books. But it's really hard to actually make it work in practice. And then recently, we were in a situation where we needed to produce a high-performance AES score on an, on an FPGA. Um, and I was tasked with this. And I found I could not do it without doing theorem-based step-by-step refinement. And so I got quite excited by that. So, oh, this technique actually works in practice. It's something that you couldn't do without that kind of technique. And so I'm kind of glad to be able to come and, and talk to you about it. What I plan to do in the talk is, first of all, give you a very brief introduction to crypto. Many of you have seen it before, so I'm going to zip very quickly um, uh, through, through that part. I'll give you, um, I think, an equally brief introduction to AES cryptography, because again, this is very well known. Um, it's been around now for about 10 years, and, and lots of people have implemented it in lots of different settings. And then we'll look at the how we did the step-by-step -step development of some of the critical components of the algorithm. Um, that will be the meat of the talk, and we'll, we'll look at the results of when we put it on an FPGA. So that's the plan um, for the talk. So um, Krypton itself is a, a declarative specification language that we've been um, working on at Galva for a while. We have um, clients who use this language both within the industrial sector and within the government sector. And there's a whole set of tools associated with this for being able to, um, well, really do all sorts of things um, with, with the cryptographic specification. Um, what we're going to focus today on is the automatic synthesis down to FPGA from a, a high, essentially from a functional language. And, and kind of like Leonard's talk earlier, we started with Haskell as, as a, um, I, I don't know, moral foundation of what we're doing, and then we also are very pragmatic in, um, we, we, we don't really have recursion either. <laughs> <laughs> so, the idea of, um, of crypto is that you have this, I mean, it's the old domain specific language story writ large. You have one um, uh, foundational language that you use as the, as the launching point for all sorts of different um, tools, such as real formal methods and test cases that we, that we have, and I'm not going to talk about um, deeply today, hardware implementations either onto FPGAs or, or special purpose processes, uh, software implementations. Some of these formal models and test cases, uh, some of our clients um, like using crypto when they get a whole bunch of VHDL to describe a cryptographic um, circuit. The first thing they do is write a crypto specification for what it's supposed to do, and then use our tools to demonstrate to what extent the FPGA actually matches that specification or doesn't. So I said I'd give you a very quick um, sense of what crypto is like, very quick feel of it. So it's um, at its core, it's, it's a first order functional program, um, and uh, we have a, a I mean, technically there is higher order stuff, but it's a little bit like Leonard said, all of that stuff gets done at compile time. And, and what you end up with is um, uh, just a, a, a first order functional language. And the only time we actually do use recursion, it's sort of zero order recursion, so you can have recursive stream equations. Um, anything else gets, it, uh, gets uh, performed at that compile time. So um, the one cool thing that um, uh, we have is, is quite a rich 
large type uh, size type system. So um, again, we're using list notation. Um, don't necessarily think of these as lists. Depends on, on how you're implementing them as to whether they're something like a fixed array, or if you're in hardware, um, one of these things might be um, uh, uh, values in parallel, or they may be values in sequence. And we'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. So a notation like this. Think of this as being four 32-bit words. F takes two 16-bit words and produces another 16-bit word. All the arithmetic is modular, the size of the word, and so on. And it's very useful to be able to talk about the size of things and very flexibly move uh, between things. Um, I said that we have um, stream equations. And so this is the kind of recursion um, that we have. Um, if I want to have something like a shift register, uh, here's how I might picture the shift register with a few, value, uh, a few initial values set up in that shift register, and then each clock tick move all the values, one to the left, and compute a new value to, to shift in. Well, the stream equation is just a straightforward uh, writing down of this. So um, uh, A's up at the top is that initial set of four values um, in hex, followed by new. And then new is the XOR of three different values. Um, the first of them comes in from A's, the next one comes one back from A's, and the next one comes in three back from A's. So um, you've got this um, natural correspondence between these kind of diagrams and how you might write it as uh, stream equations. So that's the style of, of crypto programs, and we'll see some um, uh, larger examples as we as we look at the AES circuit. So that's crypto itself. Then why why FPGAs? Well, um, there's for a long time been custom crypto chips that are, are used for um, being able to do cryptography, like. Custom DSP chips have been used for uh, digital signal processing. You get the same kind of thing in, in cryptography. But the difficulty is that those chips are so hard to keep up to date with all the latest advances in, in, um, uh, process, in, in um, fabrication. And so there's a, a strong push um, in both within industry and within the government to be able to move cryptography to FPGA-based solutions. It will run nice and fast. And, um, and there's this very natural match between so much of what goes on in cryptography um, and FPGAs. A little bit less so now that we, uh, a lot of cryptography is involved in um, big prime numbers and, and things like that. But for a long time, certainly for something like AES, it's all about bits and bit manipulation and so on. There's, there's cool algebraic properties like the bytes themselves are, are seen as polynomials within um, uh, describing elements in what's called Galois field 2 to the 8. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, they're just bits, and you just represent them as 8 bits and, and manipulate them as such. So um, why use crypto to produce um, FPGAs? And I think there's a couple of factors about that. First of all, this uh, notion of these fixed length sequences that we have, where we know how big the sizes are, very natural uh, uh, matching down to sort of bit vectors that you might put in on an FPGA. And then you've got these pure functions that go from inputs to outputs, very natural parallelism, all the, all the sorts of things that the functional programming world have been um, talking about for a long time. What about states? Well, we saw states just in that shift register kind of thing that we had before. That's a kind of recursive um, stream equation where there are values within the stream and then you move things on and put new values in. And so where you get the feedback on the stream, that naturally models kind of um, register sorts of things. And I think it's very interesting when you're dealing with highly parallel hardware that this sequentialization just comes from data dependency. And it, again, it's the story that the functional programming world has been talking for a long time. And, and similarly, when you think about a sequence, is a sequence just going to all the elements exist at the same time? Or, or do you think of the sequence as here's a value, now here's the next value, now here's the next value? And for long, I love this quote um, that I'm going to give you back from 1908. Um, from Minkowski, henceforth space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows. And only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. That's, that's got to be something about the essence of what we're trying to do, right? And not, not just here, but in a lot of things where we spe trade space from time and being able to move 
very smoothly between them. I think that's something fundamental. It's not the Gabba Martin version. I tried to grow the stash. <laughs> um, and, um, and I think it's really uh, useful because then users can explore, um, in, in doing synthesis of FPGA designs, there's a very natural way then to explore space-time trade-offs. Am I going to have this thing um, really compact and reusing a lot of the space again and again, or am I going to have it expanded out and do a lot more things in parallel? And, and depending on the particular constraints of your FPGA, you may care about one thing or you may care about the other. So how do we use um, uh, crypto in, um, in FPGA um, uh, development itself? Well, first of all, we start out with the specification, the, the crypto spec that we, that we care about. And then we, um, we um, may take this beautifully clean, high-level spec, and we might then write a variant of it. And we'll see a, a whole bunch of these variants of it that we think more of as the implementation specification. So that may have made some sort of decisions about how we're going to uh, manipulate some values, all, all sorts of things. And as I say, we'll see some examples. What happens, though, is that the original crypto specification and what we think of as the specification for the implementation will be different. And so, of course, then the question is, how do you know whether they're the same or not? And so um, we tie into the crypto interpreter. And one of the things that we have within the crypto interpreter is this ability to just uh, have theorems and have those theorems essentially quick checked really, really freely, really quickly, so that we can find out whether uh, what the correspondence between the original spec that we had and, and the implementation spec, and we can see whether the um, insights that we think we're pursuing uh, are the right things. And then, of course, you use the crypto compiler, you get out VHDL, and then you pull in, for example, Xilinx tools, and then you synthesize that, um, you get it down to the netlist, and you eventually get down to the bit file that goes on to the FPGA, and then all is, all is well um, Often you need a little bit of wrapping around things. You may, um, in a larger system, perhaps have some elements of C, and then do a whole level system simulation. <coughs> And I talked about going beyond a kind of quick check of theorems. We have a whole infrastructure for being able to do symbolic evaluation, which allows you to do much larger scale model checking or putting things into theorem groovers if you want to be able to uh, uh, establish full equivalence. What, what I found interesting in this um, path of work that I was doing was I never needed to go to any of this heavy weight stuff, that just being able to write down the properties and have quick check like things was sufficient to guide me along the path. It really was design guidance that I was looking for and places where I was getting stuck. And, and quick check was, um, was fine to, to give me that. Um, and, oh yeah, I took that quick check. So, AES itself. So, the AES algorithm, you start off with a plain text, you uh, merge in some key material, and then 10 times in, in the 128 bit case, you go around this, this loop of, um, I, I have a, a matrix, if you like, of, of 16 bytes, and every one of those bytes I substitute, and then I muddle the rows up like this, and then I muddle the columns up, but, but in a bizarre way, I muddle the columns up by viewing these things as polynomials, uh, cubic polynomials over GF2 to the 8, and then I multiply by another cubic polynomial, and then I XOR with the key, and then I go around that again and again. And when you, when you see that, it's no surprise that it's kind of hard to figure out at the end what you started with, because of all that jumbling up. So you end up with the ciphertext. What's cool about this is that each of these steps is invertible, and so that's why you can decrypt, because you can run that through the whole process. Now there's all this stuff about key addition, key addition, key addition. And what you do is with the uh, key is you start out with a certain amount of key material, and that's not enough to feed this whole process. So at the same time that you're doing this process, there's another whole process which is starting out with this initial key material and another kind of shift register <coughs> engine, which is generating, it's like a pseudo-random number generator, which is generating the pseudo-random tail of this key material, which is then what gets merged in um, at all the later stages. And the, one of the challenges that we face 
is um, in a high performance AES implementation, what you want is um, uh, if, if I've um, expanded the whole of my uh, these loops into one long thing, so I've got something like a 40 stage pipeline. In my 40 stage pipeline, the data is flowing through, flowing through, flowing through. At the same time, I want the key material to be flowing through in lockstep so that at each stage of the pipeline, I can keep feeding in the appropriate kind of key material. Now, the challenge comes in decrypt when I start here and want to run the process in the other direction. They're now working sort of contra to one another. And so one possibility is to just wait till the key material gets all the way down here and then go all the way back up. But that's immediately killed your speed by half, and, and that, that's unacceptable. So we need to find ways um, to address that kind of thing. So um, I started from a place where somebody else had done essentially some of this theorem-based derivation, starting from the reference um, uh, of AES, going through fusing the key generation with the, with the loops of the algorithm itself, doing a transformation called T-boxes, and that was just marked on this previous slide. The T-box is a standard transformation which merges those top three things. And it turns out to be quite useful to have that merge um, done for, for hardware. So you do that merge to get T-boxes, and then the actual pipelining it of how you want to, to lay it out in, in time. So we were then, um, what, what I was wanting to do was essentially follow that derivation path, and at each stage find out what the corresponding um, implementation as I, was, as I was following this design flow um, to be able to produce something that was uh, going to do AES decrypt. And there's a bunch of challenges that, that we, we face along the way. So let me give you a, a sense of, of um, some of the easy theorems, first of all. So here's the S box. That was the um, byte substitution. We just look up something in this um, 256 um, uh, length table. And so what I did was I generated the inverse. This one um, I, I printed out. That one we typed in originally, I think, or, or I forget, maybe we calculated it. But this one I calculated it and printed it out, which is why it shows up in decimal. But then I wanted to check that I didn't screw up. So here's a kind of obvious sort of theorem that I might want to write, which is when I access the S box of B and then access the U box at that same value, do I get back the um, original thing? And indeed, I do my quick check um, within Cryptol. So I'm within Cryptol, I say check, it says checking it, and it actually only needed, of course, 256 cases and it's exhaustive. So I talked about mixed column. Mixed column um, is going to take a column of this um, uh, matrix, view it as a polynomial, and produce this new column. Um, and so I multiply by one thing in encrypt. In decrypt, I multiply by a very different polynomial. And again, when I implement this kind of thing, um, uh, I, should, uh, I, I want to make sure that, that the two things are, are inverse of one another. So this top one is the multiplication by that first polynomial. You'll see the 3, 1, 1, 2 there. And the others are all shifts of that because, if you recall, it was modulo um, x to the 4 plus 1. And if you were to calculate what happens there, essentially that's a, like a left shift of everything which is why all the others are rotating. So when I was writing down what I hoped was the inverse matrix of that operation, it took me a couple of steps to get right. It's really nice to be able just to write down a property to say, this is what I think the property is. When I mix column and then mix column D, I get back to what I, I start with. And again, what I can do is um, just check that I haven't screwed up here. For me, it was a sense of being able to build something and then know I was standing on firm ground, and then build the next thing and know that I was standing <coughs> on firm ground. And so when I got a problem, it was a very limited scope. I didn't have to think now where in my whole um, uh, specification might my, my problem be. Tom, you might do this. Is, this is a sort of uh, what, a crypto thing. So this is all. This is all crypto source code. So crypto has a. So you just write theorem within your crypto. Um, so it's, um, yeah, claim or hope, that's right. Um, and um, when, you, when you load the file, it will automatically do a quick check and it will tell you whether your theorem is okay or not um, from, 
hand off to much higher power tools and say, now really check my theorems. Right. Okay. Um, so, so it is more than just a, a sort of passive hope in that it does get checked every time that you load the file. Um, and then at any point you can say explicitly, check the theorems, all the theorems that are in, in scope at the moment. And um, so, so this one. Um, uh, one of the guys who was involved in implementing this, who was really into model checking, didn't like the idea that people might just think quick check was enough. So he always does this coverage, you know, just to point out that, you know, even though he tested a thousand cases, it's a negligible portion. <laughs> so again, a thousand cases out of that many possible cases. But, you know, a thousand cases was good enough for me. <laughs> if this passed a thousand cases, I probably had them screwed up. So key expansion, um, this is this kind of shift register. We've got a, um, a W's here feeding back in. That was the kind of thing that we saw with A's and U um, earlier. Um, so this key expansion uh, at the moment runs in uh, lockstep with encryption. What I had to do was produce a new version of, of key expansion that would start with the key material at the end and would sort of run it backwards. And it's not so easy just to take some of these equations and, and invert them. It took me you know, four or five attempts. So it was really helpful as I went through the various attempts. Here was um, my final attempt, which of course was the one that was working, um, along with how to generate the flipped key from the original key, that I could write down the, the theorem. That is, the key expansion, if I reverse that, that's the same as starting out with a flipped key and then running the key expansion in reverse. And indeed, I could do my, uh, my proof of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I still had a thousand cases, which was still you know, good. Um, so I, I always used to have this FPGA envy of 
Sam, who could always put up these great pictures of things on FPGAs. And now, at last, but he's not here in the audience. It's so <laughs> anyway, so Cryptol allows you to generate things either at gate level to get those counts to produce the VHDL itself, to do a simulation flow um, either without or with um, place and rank, depending on how, how much time um, and profit uh, you want to consume. Mm -hmm. So the performance that we ended up getting from this is, um, uh, this is on the Vertex 4, um, talked about the uh, frequency that we're running. It's really cool. For, I mean, I don't know hardware, okay? I, I'm a software guy. But here are, I've actually produced an FPGA that runs at a clock speed of less than three nanoseconds that does AES decrypt. Ah, I'm really excited. And, well, technically, apparently, it's going to run just over three nanoseconds. And that's a, a clock speed of 325 uh, megahertz. But this is a throughput of over 41 gigabits per second. Now, that is, I mean, that is state of the art. That's as fast as, as people get on these kinds of platforms. So, this is really good performance over those crazy methods. And the comparison with um, Encrypt was I got the same speed as Encrypt, but, but larger space. And the reason that there's larger space is that there's more computation that needs to be done. So, I think I'll um, just uh, wrap up. I'm out of time. I mentioned that we've got some of these other ways of. of getting higher assurance than just quick check. But for me, the quick check was, was by far enough. So that's it. That's it. That's it. I didn't just have consistent internal consistency with decrypt. 
I also had the encrypt direct, and so I could I could check that it was produced, it was the inverse of the encrypt. Right, that's what I mean. So the strong consistency condition is that the encrypt and the decrypt are mutually inverse, but they might both do nothing. That's oh, also, that's what I mean. It doesn't, it doesn't show that you have, did, did you need to do anything to be careful to show that you had actually implemented the AES algorithm, not some broken version of it? Because um, a lot of broken versions of the spec, like it's evolved, a lot of easy to screw up and do something that isn't secure after all. Uh, well, actually, it's not so. I mean, um, I shouldn't say it's not so easy, but then um, you know, the FIP certification, they identify that lots of people who submit code for FIP certification simply doesn't pass the test fit. Um, but cryptography is such high entropy that you actually only need to test it on a, a relatively small number of test vectors, and um, uh, that will confirm um, uh, correctness up to, I mean, it's, it's hard to put my, my you mean you compared it with somebody else to reference it? Oh, uh, compared it with the reference, uh, the, uh, reference test vector set, there's a sort of set of test vectors. So my question is, had that failed? And perhaps you 